So a little bit of context around this conversation. Mark and I have spent the last couple of years working on the Power Queen Green team. We've both now spun out uh, in our own directions. So myself at Devonian, which I was just talking about, um, and Mark is with Nova Energy. Um, at Filecoin Green, we thought um, a lot about, I talk about Filecoin Green as if it's in the past. Filecoin Green is still a thing. <laughs> People ask often, it is still a thing. <laughs> um, at Filecoin Green, we thought a lot about transparency, about verifiability when it comes to sustainability, sustainability claims for the network in particular, but also how can we apply those things more broadly. Um, so, you know, with Devonian, we focus a lot on like the data and code management side of things um, with when it comes to verifiability. And with Nova, you guys are doing a lot of stuff with like real world impacts, um, working with storage providers within the network. So um, I wanted to, I guess my first question is just kind of, can you talk about the, the journey of Nova Energy? How did it come from Falcon Green to where you are today? What yeah. are some of the things you guys are working on? Yeah, definitely. Thanks. Um, yeah, it's been quite a natural progression, I would say. So just to give everybody a little bit of context, about three and a half years ago, <clears throat> my former colleague, boss, and now Caitlin's um, co-founder, Alan, Dr. Alan Ransel, uh, was working for Protocol Labs. And <clears throat> after the official launch, mainnet launch of Filecoin, as the network started to grow, as more storage providers started to uh, join the network, it became quite apparent quite early on that there was going to be a significant amount of electricity consumed by all of the storage providers amongst the network. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, and that we needed to do something to address that electricity consumption that was starting to pop up around the world from what is now, you know, more than 3000 independent storage providers scattered around the world. And so we Alan created Filecoin Green uh, and we all joined um, about two and a half years ago. And um, the Filecoin Green was the environmental initiative for Protocol Labs and for the for IPFS and, and for Filecoin. And it really had a dual mandate of one, making the Filecoin network verifiably sustainable, um, but also two, to build tools that um, could address environmental impacts far outside the scope of just Filecoin. And one of the first things that we built uh, as a team, uh, actually Alan started this far before we all joined, was something or is something called the Filecoin Energy Dashboard. So right now you can go to filecoin.energy, uh, that's the URL, and you can see uh, all of these network-wide metrics and statistics about the energy use and related environmental impact of the Filecoin network. Um, there's various charts about cumulative energy use. There's various charts about the location of that energy use, um, about what that translates into from a re uh, an emissions perspective based on various methodologies. And then there's also a, a set of crucial charts that highlight all of the renewable energy that we connected to all of those operations around the world. Um, and what's really great about this also is that uh, not only can you see all of these statistics from a network-wide energy perspective, but you can also dive in and look at it from a country by country perspective and even into individual minor IDs that exist on the Filecoin network. So it gives you a lot of transparency into the overall energy use and related environmental impact of the network. Um, and the way that we're able to do that is by translating the on-chain proofs that Filecoin storage providers are continuously contributing to the Filecoin blockchain, uh, translating those into really granular energy use metrics. And there's a whole methodology behind the dashboard that's you know right there on the dashboard that you can dive into to get an understanding of, of exactly how that is being done. Um, but as we developed that and as we started um, using that as a measurement or a gauge of how we were performing from an environmental basis, we, as in the Filecoin network, it became very apparent that we needed to do something um, that was more than just those estimates derived from those on-chain proofs. We needed a more comprehensive and more granular way to address the electricity consumption and related environmental impact of every actor within the Filecoin ecosystem. Um, and so that naturally led us to creating uh, what is now called the energy validation process. But really what it is, is just a very, very comprehensive energy use audit where we have defined a specific set of reporting requirements for storage providers um, within the Filecoin ecosystem to self-report on. We collect, analyze, aggregate that information, 
Very crucially, we have independent third-party auditors validate that information. So if they provide a you know electricity utility bill and a you know location, a, aka an address and some minor IDs and things like that, the third-party auditors will do their auditing work to make sure that that is true data. Um, and then from there, we um, kind of coalesce all that data once it's been audited and verified by the auditors and distill it down into a simple one individual score that we call the green score it's based on this 12 step methodology to give everybody a very uh, thorough snapshot of what their entire environmental impact is. Um, and I mentioned the EVP, it's, it's 57 individual data points that we're collecting and having analyzed and things like that. And um, uh, we have validated it time and time again. We worked on it for two years at Filecoin Green, applied it to Filecoin storage providers. And then about a year ago, um, we uh, really recognized that, okay, it was doing, it was serving us well within the Filecoin ecosystem, but is also applicable far outside of just the Filecoin ecosystem. And so we launched Nova Energy earlier this year um, with the aim of applying it far outside the Filecoin ecosystem. And now we're really focused on three major uh, market segments, still focused on the Web3 node operations, uh, but expanding it beyond Filecoin to really cover the whole gambit of any node operator in any network. So Bitcoin miner, Ethereum validator, Cosmos validator, Solana, ICP, you know, you, you name it. Um, if you are running hardware, whether in a cloud instance or actually bare metal in a data center, we can work with you, help you from an energy monitoring perspective, help you with, from an environmental impact perspective, help you from a regulatory reporting perspective, and help you uh, drive energy efficiency gains slash decarbonize your operations. Second major uh, market opportunity or, or market segment that we're really catering to is AI models. Um, it's a topical theme these days. And... Um, uh, it's a similar type of situation, right? At Nova, we're really just focusing on helping uh, develop solutions to decarbonize any compute environment. So AI models are, at the end of the day, just a bunch of hardware in rack space somewhere around the world that is consuming electricity, likely consuming a tremendous amount of water as well for cooling purposes, whether that's immersion or just in general HVAC, and uh, therefore having a significant environmental impact. So... We're working on the Web3 space across the gamut, working on AI models uh, also kind of across the gamut. And then the third major area is just more broadly um, co-location data centers, because uh, once again, a lot of these first two market segments, Web3 nodes, as well as AI models, uh, gen generally tend to reside within co-location data centers. And there is a tremendous amount of uh, upcoming environmental regulations around the world, but most notably here in the EU and back in the US that are significantly impacting uh, co-location data centers and effectively mandating from a legally binding perspective that they report some of these metrics, such as their energy consumption, such as their water consumption, such as their scope one and scope two emissions. So that's a little bit of background, Anova, as you know, and um, uh, more about exactly what we're aiming to do. That's awesome. I am really excited about the AI work that you guys are doing. Um, did a kind of like a, a pilot of uh, that that validation process with um, Equity Labs and their Climate GPT. Super, super cool. Loved. Yeah, yeah, that was a lot of fun. Uh, Equity Labs, which is another ecosystem partner within Filecoin, uh, they teamed up with the UAE sovereign uh, energy company um, with support from the royal family to create a um, uh, LLM for climate researchers uh, called Climate GPT. As Caitlin just mentioned, it's very apt that a, a model called Climate GPT has an environmental assessment done of it. Um, this model was tr uh, trained and tuned um, based on LAMA 2, 70 billion parameter model. So it's not a huge model, but it did have... Um, you know, just even a 70 billion parameter model consumed a, a significant amount of electricity and they trained and tuned it um, across six different data centers around the world. Um, the majority of the training actually did take place right outside of Seattle um, 
in some data centers. One, the the emissions grid mix in outside of Seattle is pretty good because there's so an abundance of hydro. Um, but even those data centers went above and beyond and procured renewable energy to make sure that they were not just like carbon neutral, but like heavily carbon negative. So from an environmental perspective, they actually performed quite well. Um, but it was really great to work with them. We love what they're doing. And um, as you mentioned, that was kind of our first step into the AI world. And now we're starting to work across um, at, on some bigger projects um, to apply that same type of work there. So cool. I obviously am a big fan of what you guys are doing because we work together. Same, same. Um, I want to kind of bring it back to our roots a little bit and talk about like your guys' tech stack. You guys are obviously ut utilizing IPFS. Right. Why? Yeah, um, a, a number of reasons. Uh, we are using IPFS. We actually, in the past few months since we re-architected, we kind of, or excuse me, since we spun out, we re-architected our entire back end, basically tore down everything and built back up from the ground up. We're now using Ceramic Network for anybody that is familiar with Ceramic um, because their onboarding process, their their docs, their their support is is great. Um, it's really difficult to find, you know, somebody with such dedicated resources, um, such as them. And for a small team, it's me, my co-founder right now, Naima. Um, so for a small team, it's been very, very helpful to have their support. Um, but the, to your question, or like the primary reason for IPFS from uh, an environmental uh, assessment, from the perspective of creating environmental assessments, one of the most important things is establishing trust and credibility in the environmental claims that you are, you know, creating or stating, right? You see in the corporate landscape, people make their shiny sustainability reports at the end of the year, say that they did X, Y, Z, but there's no underlying, you know, data underlying that to substantiate those claims. And what we have come to realize and what we uh, really focus on is making sure that there is a um, an audit trail to our audits <laughs> that you can follow and see how the data has changed over time to substantiate the, the newer audits or the newer assessments, right? So if a data center says that they have decarbonized and they have, you know, um, decreased their PUE, their power utilization effectiveness, which is a marker of your energy efficiency uh, for, for a data center or for a compute environment, um, we want to be able to see, you know, throughout time how they have actually made progress on that. And by utilizing file or um, <laughs> by utilizing IPFS, we're able to create these kind of end to end audit trails of the state changes made to data over time. Right. That's just one of the great things about content addressing data. It's like, you know, you're, you're collecting, analyzing data kind of taking a snapshot of it by putting it on IPFS, creating a CID of it, right, from from content addressing it. And then when there is an update to that, you take another snapshot of that data, put that on an IPFS. You can link the, the previous record to the current record. So you just establish this kind of immutable chain of trust showcasing how information has changed over time. And from our perspective, from an environmental assessment perspective, and even more crucially, from a environmental regulations perspective, it's absolutely of paramount importance that you have that kind of uh, audit trail uh, of the data over time. I want to get more into that, but before we do that, um, I'm wondering if you can speak to some of maybe the pain points. You mentioned that you guys completely like re-architectured everything. Um, I think there's a lot of really cool things happening in like the IPFS ecosystem, a lot of ways to make it easier to, you know, tap into this ecosystem and utilize it. Um, so what were your guys's challenges or pain points in like that process of reacting everything? So, Saturday morning hot take. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, it's kind of the, the crazy paradox and this is by no way meant to like, you know, point fingers or anything, but like we as a community always talk about how resilient how, um, not fault tolerant, but how resilient the technology is, right? And how incredible it can be from, you know, making sure that your data is safe and that it's, you know, it's not touched and things like that and, and forever present and whatever terminology you want to use. Um, but what we have experienced is that oftentimes the companies developing those solutions preaching that mantra, uh, they are not as resilient, right? We're all early stage, or many of us are very early stage startups. And sometimes, you know, companies kind of 
you know, change tack or, or, or leave the ecosystem or new ones come in or something like that. And so over the course of our several years within Falcon Green and, and, you know, now with Nova, we've come to see the, like several solutions that we were relying on or were, you know, thinking of utilizing then may not be as resilient from a product perspective for us to base our product on. Yeah. So I think that's one of the current challenges and I'm really excited. I mean, even just this week, there's been incredible energy um, at all Filecoin and IPFS events that I've been to in the broader deep in narrative as well about how teams are now starting to recognize that and saying not only is the tech resilient, but also our companies and what we stand for. We're here for the long term. We want to be able to service customers for long term. That is that's a really good take. I, I'm Thank glad you. you mentioned that. <laughs> um, I know you guys are using ceramic now, um, which I think is great. I think the, I uh, was it yesterday. Yeah, yesterday. Um, heard about some of the awesome work that they're doing, um, which is super exciting. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious what, from your perspective and from Nova's perspective, um, what else can this community do or build or help with that will enable you guys to continue doing your work or expanding into new areas? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I mean, I feel like we're at the start of a Cambrian explosion uh, right now with actually Devonia um, with so many new cool things coming into space. So it's, it's hard to say like take stock of the entire IPFS yeah. or Filecoin ecosystem and say, Oh, here's the glaringly obvious thing that's missing. Um, and it's kind of, it's kind of nice uh, that that's the case because on a daily basis, you may stumble upon something that's just like, holy cow, this is awesome. I didn't know it existed. It's like this new tooling that I can utilize. Um, I actually, I don't know if you guys know of this or if anybody actually maintains this anymore, but the awesome IPFS uh, online tutorial or resources where basically every IPFS related project was hosted and you can go and learn about it and everything like that. Back 2016, I think, was when I first like got introduced to IPFS. Maybe, yeah, 2016. And um, uh, that was one of the ways that I started learning about everything in the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's simple little resources like that that help you make sense of this very rapidly evolving ecosystem are um, really refreshing. And um, once again, I can't pinpoint one specific thing, but I think the the more resources that we have that allow us to better understand all of the moving pieces and all of the evolution taking place in the space is really helpful. Yeah, I 100% agree. Um, I think to that point as well, like just more uh, resources on the real world applications and like the really cool stuff that's happening in this ecosystem. Obviously, IPFS camp is like a great way to learn about um, everything that people are doing, but I feel like sometimes we can kind of uh, exist in a little bubble. <laughs> yeah, so having those things that are like more readily available, um, accessible, I think are really important. Totally. Um, I think we have a few more minutes and then maybe we can do questions. Um, I want to know, I want you to put on your, uh, you know, vision hat. M imagine the future. Sure. Um, what in the future you know, what does that look like for, you know, sus sustainable decentralized storage for verifiable sustainability claims? Um, yeah, like what, what does that look like and how does Nova kind of tie into that? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. And I, I'll actually do kind of two segments here. Um, decentralized sustainable storage is one huge topic and, and verifiable environmental claims. Totally different, but, you know, very similar um, topic. Uh, first, from a, not even from a decentralized storage, but from a renewable energy storage perspective uh, and compute, uh, the, the world's experiencing some pretty drastic shifts right now in terms of the amount of compute infrastructure that is currently available in, in like in the queue to be built. As we all know, every major hyperscale or every major tech company in the world right now is throwing hundreds of billions of dollars at creating new data centers um, for, you know, more advanced AI models for more advanced um, compute environments, plain and simple. And uh, with that, of course, comes a significant amount of electricity consumption. Um, <laughs> you know, Elon Musk is a 
controversial figure. He said some things that people don't like. Um, and uh, so take this with a grain of salt. But he was recently on the Lex Friedman podcast, if you guys are familiar with that. And Lex Friedman posed a question to him. Is like, what are your existential fears? What are, what are you really, really concerned about? And to no surprise, Elon said the normal things, you know, like he's really, really focused on being a multiplanetary species. So he really wants to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to make that happen. Um, he's really concerned about climate change, of course, not only in the near term, but long term. Um, and, and, and AI, of course, rogue AI and everything like that. But then at the tail end of this, he said something really interesting, which was actually on the like closest time frame, what I'm really concerned about is that we're about to run out of free and available electricity around the world because everybody in the broader tech space and new entrants as well are starting to build significant, significant um, compute infrastructure that is just sapping up all of the latent supply of electricity around the world. And utility providers, grid operators, and many, many places around the world are seeing that right now. They're feeling those constraints. If you go to Northern Virginia, which we all know is a major hub for data centers in the US, the interconnection queue, which is when new projects can come online to that grid area, it's something like 11 years right now, right? Data centers are going to that region saying, hey, we've got an existing data center. We want to double our capacity because of you know our new computing needs. And the utility provider is saying, that's great. You can you know, start your project, but you won't be able to connect with us from a utility provider for 11 years. That is insane. That is the most bloated these interconnection queues have ever been. So the world right now with the rise of more advanced AI, with this um, new interest in doubling, tripling, quadrupling the capacity and the energy intensity of various compute environments, we are um, seeing some very interesting dynamics play out as it relates to the available electricity that we have on the grid around the world, not just in the US, in the EU, even in Southeast Asia, we're already seeing some of these constraints. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see how these dynamics play out from an energy markets, from an electricity perspective, and from a compute perspective over the next few years. And back to what you just mentioned, you know, that's uh, an area Nova really wants to work in. Because we know that uh, in order for us to stave off some of the worst effects of climate change, we need to do absolutely everything that we can to make sure that the electricity that's being consumed is coming from more and more clean sources. And if we have this drastically, this not new area, but this, you know, uh, very mature industry of data centers and of general compute that is now experiencing a very drastic rise in utilization and electricity consumption, we don't want to see that all come from non-renewable sources. We want to make sure that the majority of that new supply is coming from clean or cleaner sources to make sure that it's not a, you know, dirtier and dirtier industry. You know, period, <laughs> new paragraph, totally other thing. The verifiable uh, environmental um, uh, claims and credentials, this goes back to what I mentioned earlier about just like general corporate sustainability reporting, um, whether, it's a, whether it's a corporation, whether it's a country, right, everybody has uh, this tendency to produce these very shiny, fancy sustainability reports at the end of the year saying, this is what we've done, you know, it, we've done all this great stuff, here's the numbers. And that's fantastic. I'm glad that people are reporting on it. And, and I'm not trying to say that like they shouldn't do that. But what I'd really like to see is the data underlying those claims and being able to attest to that or, or um, verify that what they're saying is true for my own account. Mm -hmm. Right. And being able to say, OK, you know, Google, you say that you're running on 65 percent carbon free electricity for all of your data center you know, fleet, global data center fleet, uh, other than your blanket statement of saying that, how can I verify that? And so I think that's where some of this work of doing these really granular environmental assessments with data underlying them being content addressed to establish that chain of trust of the state changes made to data throughout time is, is really important and hopefully will be really impactful. Yeah, but I completely agree. Um, I think that's a really great note to end this conversation on. Um, I guess my last question, very brief, is like, how can people connect with you, uh, work with you? Yeah, we are, uh, you can find us at novaenergy.ai. 
Um, we also have a Twitter. We also have a LinkedIn. We also have a Farcaster for yeah the the young ones. Um, and yeah, if you guys are interested in any of this, if you're doing anything with like bare metal hardware servers, anything like that, if you're in the data center space, by all means, let's chat. Um, we love to better understand the constraints, the pain points, the perspectives that you are dealing with and uh, hope that we can work with you from an energy monitoring and environmental assessment perspective. Awesome. Thank you, Mark.